Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. David, thank you for taking some time to join me on the show. Great to be with you. We're going to talk about the business at large, the BHP, BHP business, the global landscape and the customers that you sell into and how that may evolve over time, the commodity groups that uh, you specialize in. And um, we're just saying that uh, I, in my preparation for this interview, I learned that BHP has paid, correct me if I'm wrong, the most dividends of any company in the last three years in dividends. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Which is a wonderful feat and probably representative of how much we love our dividends here in Australia. And we did have some questions sent in advance that did illustrate the importance of cash flow and dividends. So you're the right man to speak to. But to begin our conversations, we typically like to break the ice with a few tongue in cheek, short answer questions, if I may, kind of like a teacher, if you cast your mind back to high school. And one thing that investing podcasts, finance podcasts are known for, and even the financial media, they love a forecast. So rather than get a forecast out of you for what the dividend might be or the earnings or how you see the financial world, let's take a bit of a turn. We're recording this in Melbourne. And for anyone that's global, we are watching, this is in the south of Australia where the premier football code is the AFL. And I know you're a Geelong fan. So I'm going to ask you a question that's close to my heart. The final ladder in 2024, when we look back on it, who will be higher Geelong Cats or the Hawthorne Hawks? That's a good question. I and last night I was actually listening to a podcast from Stephen Wells, who's the Geelong recruitment uh, manager, and he was very upbeat. So my answer obviously has to be Geelong. Okay. Um, there's a great rivalry between Geelong and Hawthorne for those mm-hmm. that do follow the AFL, uh, and I think that this is another example where Geelong will come out on top. Mm, well, I'll let you have that one for now and disagree maybe in the back of my mind. Um Peter Lynch says that a good investment is one that you could explain to a fifth grader and quick enough so they don't get bored. I'm curious if a fifth grader was to ask you what you do every day, how would you explain that? Look, it's a good question. I've got two daughters that are 24 and 27. And when they were young, um, they always used to ask me, so what, dad, what do you do? And I would say, I'm in meetings. Um, (laughs) As they matured a little bit, they said, you've got to give us a little bit more color than that. So I used to describe it like uh, we're trying to bake a cake. uh, And what I'm looking to do is arrange the ingredients and actually decide year on year how we make that cake better uh, for those that wish to eat that, being our shareholders. And, you know, one of the things in, in my role is very much about how you actually allocate capital and put resources to, to work. Mm, I love that. Good analogy. I haven't heard that one before. So that's, that's a special one from uh, your family. Uh, the third one of these quick questions is the most underrated business book that you have found. And when I say this, uh, it could also be something that had maybe a profound impact on the way you think about business, um, maybe a, a gem that you've come across over many years in your career. Yeah, look, uh, one that I've read most recently is um, Made to Stick, which is a book by Chip and Dan Heath. Uh, And it was all around how you actually take business ideas and they run them through different business scenarios to actually say when have they worked and when they haven't. You know, I think the the business world is all about generating options and ideas and just seeing how we can actually make those last. Mm, I like it. I haven't actually heard that. I've I've heard Built to Sell. I've read that one, but... um yeah, made to stick. Made to it? stick. Yeah, right. Okay. So the this conversation is quite interesting in many ways, but one of the things that became apparent to me as I learned more about you is your journey and your career over time has taken a few turns in the sense of you've jumped sectors, if you will, uh, which, you know, if you're, if you're making cakes, um, you could probably make cakes at a different shop for a little while and then learn something that, you know, there and bring it back uh, to where you are now. But many people who have followed your journey will know that you spent a lot of time at CSL, for example, um, before becoming CFO here at BHP. I'm curious, rather than go back in time and step by step in your entire career, because we'd probably need a lot longer to distill some of those ideas and those methods that you've used, if you could maybe recall some of the key moments in your career and how those have shaped you and the way you lead in a business sense today. 
Yeah, so if I reflect on my career, with, and, and again, without going into any of the individual specifics, there's sort of three things that I sort of reflect on that has helped me. Um, the first one was very early on in my career, I just said yes. Um, so if someone would come with a new opportunity, a new proposition, um, and, and, you know, what that opportunity was, I didn't quite always know hmm. uh, and calculate through, but I just generally said yes, because I saw it as a great way to grow. Um, and explore different things and challenge myself in, in that regard. Uh, the second thing that I'd actually reflect on is respect failure. Uh, we're all human. Uh, by nature, that means we make mistakes. And I think sometimes what people do is they get too in their comfort zone and don't actually stretch the boundaries. And by pushing myself at times, yeah, I didn't always succeed in everything that I did, but I learned from it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the big thing is how do you actually then embed that into the next challenge that you actually can take on board and make sure you don't repeat uh, any of the mistakes that you've perhaps made in the past. Uh, and the final one for me was right throughout my career, I've always had good mentors and, and coaches. So sounding boards that I could go to and say, you know, how, do, how should I think about this? Am I on the right track or am I not? And certainly when it came to career and different opportunities that presented itself, again, having someone to talk things through and, and actually say, does this make sense? Mm. You know, is that the right thing to, to sort of do? So there's sort of three things that I think throughout my journey I've always reflected on and been able to take that forward and like to think that I help people, you know, through my leadership style to actually embrace those ideas as well. BHP is obviously a globally diversified business and um, your, your previous haunt, if I may, was a CSL, which is some might say almost equally as, as impressive and um, if I'm not mistaken, also based here in Melbourne. Um, and so you've had this kind of pedigree where you've currently here at BHP and um, previously at CSL amongst other um, really reputable companies and organizations. And I think it would be remiss of me not to ask kind of some of the lessons that you learned there that maybe you've ported across here or just things that you discovered in, at your time at CSL. Yeah, so let me start by saying CSO, I think, is a great company. Mm. Um, and so one of the things that I think was embedded into that organisation was very much around innovation. Um, you hear the catch fry, you know, um, fail fast. What I would say is at CSL, it was learn from, you know, learn quickly. Mm. So they were constantly looking at how do they actually evolve and take um, innovative ideas and build on them. Uh, as part of the overall exercise. The other thing that, that certainly comes through in relation to CSL, which is, again, very applicable also here at BHP, is it's got to sound with a, start with a very sound foundation. And that's a ma matter of making sure you're running the operations well, which then gives you the license to actually be innovative and look to grow and explore in other things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from my side of things, it was always understand where the value is created in CSL and in any organisation. And that's something that, again, I think is, is equally applicable here at BHP. Mm. When, we, when we look out the window here in Melbourne, it's a bit of a dreary day here in Melbourne, but we look out and people can look back at the building and see the BHP logo sitting on top of the building. And indeed, if you go right across Australia and throughout the world, they'll see similar logos. Um, and people know the name, whether they're direct shareholders. Uh, we've had one shareholder right in Derek who has been a shareholder for 40 years. And we've had many others that own shares in BHP via index funds or managed funds or superannuation or pension. Um, and they're right around the world as they listen to this. But it wasn't always this way, of course, and some people probably aren't familiar with the, the story of BHP. Um, they know it, they see it around, they might see advertisements on the TV, people wearing it when they walk down the street, particularly in Perth or South Australia or something like this. Can you maybe give us a sense of what you see when you come into the office every day and you think about the business and what it is? There's so much we could talk about and the, the histories and intertwining with m and and divestments and these types of things. But how do you think about what the business is now and where it's come from? Yeah, look, it's, it's a good question. And I think it comes back to a lot about where we are as an organisation from a strategic point of view and what we're looking to do. So we're all about building and creating a better and clearer future for generations to come. We're an organisation that needs to think multi-decades um, because 
what actually happens today if you find a mineral deposit from an exploration perspective all the way through to when that ultimately becomes a commercial cash generating uh, producing asset, it's about 10 to 12 years. Mm. So we're investing over a long decades as part of that. And that means we've got to step back and think about how do we actually think about some of the, the world mega trends as we like to refer to things at and how we can play a role in that. So if you look across um, the globe today, we would say there's certainly always more people. So population growth continues to, to play out. We're seeing better improvement in living standards globally across the board. We're also seeing urbanisation occurring, um, and that plays into how much arable land we have, uh, you know, the production of food that's required to service um, the globe. But then equally what we have got is uh, the extra mega trend around decarbonisation happening. Mm. And the reality of all of those mega trends is they play to what BHP does today. We produce minerals that are required uh, for the world to continue to evolve. Mm. And we do that in a way that we believe is ethical, that is safe. Uh, and as part of that, we're helping the world, you know, grow and harness that, those living standards. Mm. Um, and one of the things we're going to talk about is we're going to pop the hood on each of these major commodity groups that you target today and how those have evolved over time as well. Um, Many people may know the BHP business is well over 100 years old and it's been here for a long time. Um, and in that time, as we mentioned, things like dividends and the appeal of long-term capital growth from that stewardship around capital allocation uh, has really borne out and people have seen it rise to the top of the tables here in Australia for the, the stock market. That's the biggest business uh, in the country. Um, let's start with the... I guess the segment of your business that targets uh, steel making, iron ore. Um, this is a business that, if I'm not mistaken, is the lowest cost producer in the world. I could be mistaken, but that's my understanding. Can you tell us a bit about the iron ore business? What are the assets? Where do you sell? And maybe we can, I think one of the key takeaways from this may be the competitive advantage and how you see that. Yeah, and look, it is the most important segment of BHP today. It's our largest cash producing asset. And uh, just picking up on your your first point, yes, we are the lowest cost uh, producer uh, globally. And that certainly means that we're in a very sound position to continue to extract uh, a good return for shareholders out, out of that. Um, it, it's a business that we pro predominantly have in the Pilbara in Western Australia. Uh, we also have a, uh, a joint venture in Brazil, uh, an asset called Samarco, which also feeds into our iron ore um, portfolio. But the bulk of it is in Western Australia. Um, and critically, what we're able to do, is, as we reference, is that we are the lowest cost producer. Um, so today, uh, what we have is our overall unit cost is around about 19, last year was around about $19. So if you think about current iron ore prices, and as we sit here today, they're at $130 a tonne, mm. um, that can give you a good indication of the margins that we're able to actually extract out of that, that business. Mm. It's also a business that we continually look to see if we can expand. Um, so today, it's call it around about on a 100% basis, around about 290,000 uh, tonnes of iron ore is produced for BHP. We can see our way clear to grow that to around about 330 um, over the, the coming years. And that's all about how do we extract more out of what we've got. Uh, it's quite a, a large logistics chain. Uh, whereby we run, obviously, the mines uh, in various different hubs, ultimately put that onto a train network that we run ourselves through to a port uh, at Port Hedland in Western Australia, where we then put it on to, to ships to, to obviously sell globally. Mm. Of that product, uh, as you mentioned earlier, it goes into steel making. Um, and in essence, um, that therefore means the overall demand for it is very much built around how much steel the world world needs. Uh, most of that goes to China. So in excess uh, of 50% of our iron ore is sold today into China because today China produces you know, well over 50% of the world's steel. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately, our customers are those that are actually producing the steel output that the world needs. 
Mm. Uh, so for us, you know, focus is around how do we continue to get more out of that asset. Uh, we have what we know here in uh, BHP as BOSS, which is our BHP operating system. And by leveraging that, we're able to continue to th see how we can improve the operational excellence of the business and continue to push our costs uh, to the right level and be you know, very competitive on, on the world scale. Um, importantly, uh, steel is a commodity that is needed to help the world decarbonise. Uh, there is some changes happening within uh, the steel environment as a result of the changing in electrification occurring across the world. Uh, historically, most of steel went into construction, into the, sort of the building part of the, the economy. Um, what we are seeing is more of it's now going into sort of the finished goods, whether that's white goods, um, but also into electric vehicles, as an example. Mm. Um, more of it's going into wind farms, more of it's going into solar farms. So that's the other part where we are seeing a bit of a shift occurring in the overall steel market. But iron ore is a great business for us. Um, we have a lot of very capable people in Western Australia. Uh, I think it's a, a great demonstration of just where Australia can leverage technology, can leverage skills uh, to be a world leader. Mm and to be a competitive advantage for the nation as much as anything else. One of the concerns that people have had in recent years is, and it's not necessarily particular to uh, BHP, is I guess the, the focus on China and geopolitical things or um, even just the demand profile there. And I think I heard on a call recently the proportion of uh, steel usage in China um, that is dependent on the construction activity or the property development activity. Can you comment on the mix there uh, to any extent to give us some context? Yes, yeah, so just uh, step back a little bit into that context. The world today is around about 1.9 billion tonnes of steel and, and over a billion tonnes of that is actually manufactured in China. So mm. they, as I said, they are by far the largest producer of steel. If you go back in time, historically, around about 35 to 40% of the steel that was consumed in China went into the real estate sector. Um, and obviously, that's been a key contributor to the growth that you've actually seen uh, in China. Um, this year, uh, current trend rate is that uh, China's on track to produce over a billion tonnes of steel um, for the fifth year running. Uh, current run rate would actually see this year as the highest steel output in history of China. So yes, you get a lot in the press around the China economy and how that's produced, performing. Uh, what we are seeing uh, as far as steel output going, again, this year, 2023 is looking to be the largest steel output um, on hist in history. Hmm. What has changed, though, is this year around about 25% of that is going into the real estate sector. So what you've seen is other areas of the economy continue to grow and offset the decline that you've seen in the real estate um, segment. Mm. Now, wh what's that? What you're also seeing is it's a little bit of a shift from what's known as long products in steel that you would traditionally think about in the, the construction part of the economy into what's known as flat product, which goes into things like white goods. Uh, it goes into appliances. It, it also goes into electric vehicles. Mm. Um, uh, and again, a little fact that perhaps people aren't aware of, 50% of the world's electric vehicles today are produced in China. Mm. Um, yeah. So that's taken up the, the decline that you've seen in the real estate sector. Um, and so, yes, you sometimes hear about the China economy um, coming off. What we're certainly seeing on the steel production side of things, it's still held up very strongly this year. Yeah. One of our analysts recently just got, got back from China a few days ago and uh, said he was blown away even in China by not just the infrastructure, which is clearly uh, world class, but uh, also the number of electric vehicles on the road there. And maybe that is a leading indicator for um, what potentially could unfold globally. Uh, there was an, another question sent in specifically about Samarco and about the ability to extract value from that. Uh, that's a joint venture, uh, non-operated as far as I'm aware. Um, so the, the, the value that could be embedded in that resource going forward, how you may extract value from that. 
Um, and I guess this is more just a long-term view on or perspective on that asset, how BHP shareholders can think about value being extracted over time. Yeah, look, a good question. So let me just again step back a little bit. Um, in the world today, there's two main areas of iron ore produced. Um, that's in Western Australia and in, in, in the Pilbara, of which, as I said earlier, you know, we've got a significant presence. And the other place is Brazil. Um, and the joint venture that we have with Samarco is with Vale, who are also one of the world's largest uh, producers, or the largest actually, producer of iron ore um, globally out of Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, the Samarco asset makes pallets, which is slightly different to what we have in the Pilbara, uh, whereby we sell um, iron ore concentrate uh, as part, part of that. So it's a different um, process. Um, it actually is something that we do see value in. Uh, it's pleasing that the Samarco asset, uh, following the very unfortunate dam failure that occurred in Samarco, is actually now back up and operating. Uh, it's currently running one concentrator. Uh, we are looking to expand that into a second concentrator. Um, prior to the dam failure, it was running three um, concentrators. So it's an asset that we look to continue to um, see as part of the portfolio. Uh, um, and we work quite collaboratively with Vale, our joint venture partner. Mm. A lot of people that listen to the show uh, think about businesses um, through the lens of a competitive advantage. And one of the things that I've discovered in doing more research into BHP recently is the sense of where you sit on the cost curve, but also the impact that those assets could have on your business longer term. So maybe this is just a, a, a question, just a general question of where you see the competitive advantage of BHP over time. Yeah, so, so it comes back to that operational discipline and performance uh, as one aspect. I, I think that also with that is if you go back over time uh, and certainly uh, with Mike Henry, the CEO, since Mike became um, CEO, we've had a very clear strategy and a very clear way of how we want to lever into those mega trends that I referred to earlier. And we've been very consistent on executing against that strategy. Hmm. Now, part of that starts with understanding how we're running the assets and improving our overall operational efficiency. So being low on the cost curve uh, and, you know, back to the iron ore example where we are the lowest cost uh, producer, that means we're better able to ride through the cycles that will inevitably come in this business. Hmm. Uh, we're in a commodity. Um, yes, today we're uh, enjoying some good prices in the iron ore part of the business. Uh, but we know that it, it is a commodity that will actually move up and down. Mm. And so being low on the cost curve enables you to continue to operate efficiently and produce returns for, for shareholders. Um, one of the aspects that also goes with that is that's not something that you can take for granted. You've got to constantly actually look to see how you can extract more. And back to my earlier comment on the BHP operating system, that is a way of working that is instilled within the business, right across the business and, and the enterprise that enables us to extract um, the most out of the assets that we actually have. That is the best way that we can actually add to shareholder value. Mm. Getting more out of what we have today and continuing to run those assets uh, efficiently is a key focus. Now, we also need to ensure that we look to the future as well, and, and that probably gets us into the growth side of things, which mm. I'm sure we may touch on yeah, later. And that's where we're going, absolutely, into the, the copper business. And um, this is a fascinating part of the business and probably the thing, if I'm taking the shareholder's perspective, probably the thing that's most exciting for, for shareholders because of the demand profile out into the future combined with the asset base that you have now. Um, so let's take that as a top down. Let's look at the demand side. Let's think about the assets and the resource that you have. Um, you mentioned a good, I guess, example of maybe decarbonization is the shift to electric vehicles. I've got one myself. I know how heavy, that, heavy they are because of what's involved in putting them together and the, the, I guess the minerals that go into creating such an, uh, a vehicle. But maybe we can talk about the shift towards copper, the focus on that as a business and where that goes, maybe towards 2030. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, let me start by actually saying, you know, we've been in the copper business for a, a long period of time. Um, we run the Escondida asset in Chile, which is the world's largest um, copper 
uh, mine globally. So, you know, it's, it's a commodity we know uh, and we know well. Uh, one of the things that we, we see moving forward and just on the demand side of things for a second, we look out over the next 30 years and we would see that the world's going to need twice as much copper over the next 30 years that it actually consumed in the previous 30 years. Um, and most of that's going into the areas, as you said, are around uh, electrification and decarbonisation. Uh, and don't underestimate the amount that that actually is in the infrastructure that's actually needed as we move further down the renewable power side of things. So it's not only the end use electric vehicles, and mm. like you, I've recently acquired an electric vehicle as well as, as part of the, the overall uh, <laughs> mix. So, you know, very familiar with how that's changing. But what we also need to be able to do is ensure that we have the infrastructure in place to take the renewable power to the end consumers. Mm. And that's certainly an area whereby that requires more copper. Mm. Um, and, you know, copper is important in that overall energy transition and one of the reasons that we're focused on that as a, as a commodity. Uh, for us, we're very excited by the opportunities that present uh, on the copper side. Uh, if we look at today's um, supply into that, what we do know is that the next round of mar copper mines that will come to the world uh, are at a greater depth and are at a lower grade than where, what's there today. Mm. Um, and one thing in this industry is as you continue to mine, you deplete the resource. So you've got to constantly find a way to replenish that resource. Uh, and when we look at what's there, <clears throat> we are looking out at, as I said, greater depth and lower grade. What that actually means is the cost curve is probably going to shift. Mm. Um, so it's important that you actually think through what that means from a overall commodity supply demand and where does that, that picture now, for us, um, we're excited by the opportunities that we do see at Escondida uh, as one asset, but also in our other assets that sit uh, across the Americas. And one of the things that we are looking at is innovation as well. Um, the reality is in the last 15 to 20 odd years, as an industry, we really haven't seen any technological advancement. What we've been able to do is find the next oil deposit and continue the current practice. Mm. So one of the things that we are exploring at, at Escondida is new technology around leaching. Um, and that's just a better way to actually extract the copper out of the concentrate that we're, or to produce the concentrate out of the dirt that we're actually mining. Mm. Um, and that's something that we're excited by and we're looking at. We've got a, uh, five different options that we're looking at there to see how that could prove up. Uh, if it does, it will fundamentally change the flow sheet for copper um, as to how we produce it at Escondida. It will require less water. It will require less um, electricity or power as part of that. So that'll be a very efficient way to actually think about how we could grow that. So we're excited by what we can see at the Escondida site. Um, the other thing, and uh, I'm sure shareholders are well aware that we did acquire the Oz Minerals assets uh, recently. And that actually gives us a great opportunity to grow our South Australian copper business or copper SA as it's now referred to within BHP, whereby today that province uh, produces around about 220 to 230,000 tonnes and we can see our way clear um, through investment out to sort of 2030 and that window that you're talking about that we can produce in excess of 500. Hmm. Um, and that's all about how we integrate the prominent hill, Carabatina uh, assets in with uh, what BHP had in Olympic Dam but also the resource that we're studying at Oak Dam. Hmm. It's a great opportunity to grow there in copper. But it's a, it's a commodity we like, it's a commodity that we know well, and it's clearly a growth avenue for, for BHP. One of the, the questions that we got coming in repeatedly uh, through social media for this discussion was the capital allocation framework, which I know you and the senior team talk about quite a bit. Um, can you, for those who aren't familiar, can you kind of set the scene of how you think about capital allocation, not just with the dividend, but what the kind of the buckets are that go beyond that? 
Yeah, certainly. And let me start by saying that the capital allocation framework was put in place in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned earlier when we did the intro about lessons learnt and learning from perhaps some of the failures, uh, it was in place whereby historically there were some uh, areas where BHP perhaps didn't allocate the capital as efficiently as it could have. So in 2016, that um, process was actually put in place. And what I would say to you is today it's just seen as the way we work. Mm. Um, so within BHP, it is a known process that we actually look at. And it starts with, as I said right at the start, generating enough cash by running the assets as efficiently as we possibly can. Uh, what we then do with that cash flow is that we say we need to reinvest back into the business as well as give a return to shareholders. And the capital allocation framework defines how we'll actually go about doing that. So the first thing that we always will look to do is ensure that we maintain the assets from a maintenance perspective and from a safety perspective. So capital is required to go into sustaining and, and managing that those assets. The second thing that we will do is pay out a minimum of a 50% uh, dividend to shareholders. And after those two areas have actually been done, we look at what is the excess funds that are available within a debt framework of five to 15 billion. So we're not looking to stress the balance sheet as mm -hmm. part of that. So within that five to 15 US dollars um, framework, we then go how much additional funds do we have to either reinvest back in the business in, the, in relation to growth um, and we've indicated uh, this year that we're targeting closer to sort of $11 billion of capital expenditure in totality. So that includes the sustaining and minor uh, capital as such. So the majority of that is going into growth orientated assets. And then we also look at, do we return more to shareholders through either additional dividends over that 50% payout? Uh, and most recently, mm. we have done that or would we look at potentially um, share buybacks? Mm. Um, so that's the framework that we actually go through. I think it's a great framework to create capital discipline across the organisation. It does make the organisation also, or the enterprise understand that capital is a scarce resource and people need to be able to compete for that. And I think it drives us to, to ensuring that we're maximising the, the value that we can deliver to shareholders. Mm. So that just to uh, double click on that five to 15 million, is, is that effectively in place uh, so that you've modelled through the cycle if you were to sustain kind of the cyclical, the downside cyclicality of commodity prices that you would kind of weather that but also maintain the firepower to then make, say, acquisitions or make strategic capital allocation decisions when other businesses may not have that discipline? In my mind, on the right track there. Yeah, you're absolutely on the right track. So, so it's there to ensure that we have a strong balance sheet, um, because that's the best way to weather commodity fluctuations um, mm. um, through the, the cycle as such. That's why we do have a ten billion dollar US, ten billion dollar range there from the five to fifteen. Uh, it is pleasing that post the uh, the acquisition of Oz Minerals, we're back in that five to fifteen range um, today. So. It does enable us to actually have some firepower as well if we see that there's right opportunities in relation to, to any M&A type of transactions. But it also ensures that we're able to invest back in the business. Um, and whilst we were talking earlier about the strategy and direction, probably a nice place just to sort of also mention the commodity that we're moving into, which is mm, potash. Yeah. Um, and so we did announce Janssen Stage 1, uh, which was $5.7 billion going into Canada for, for the potash business. We've also just recently announced Janssen Stage 2, which is $4.9 billion US dollars going in as a further um, aspect. And we see this as a great commodity to add into the BHP portfolio. It plays into that global mega trend around more people, population growth, and less arable land. And what that actually means is that crop yields need to improve. And the best way to do that is through fertilizer. Uh, and potash is a natural resource that goes into that part of the segment. Um, and we see it as a really good way to, to add to the overall portfolio. 
So that's part of that reinvestment, as I said, back into the business. Uh, all of that was run through our capital allocation framework. It needed to compete with other growth options. Um, and certainly we do see the returns on that uh, as meeting the rates that we need to see to continue to sort of invest. Um, importantly, that will come into the market in 2026. Janssen Stage 1 uh, will be um, then, you know, moving in from a, 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 a drain, if you like, on the capital mm. allocation because it's not producing any cash today to 26 when it will start to produce um, cash flow. Uh, and then Janssen Stage 2 will follow in 2029. So, mm. you know, a great opportunity for us to, to move into a new commodity and also add to the overall portfolio. So we spoke about uh, some of the, maybe the competitive advantages, that cost curve and how that profile shifts through time, marry that with the demand profile. But then obviously another element is probably the, what we might call the economies of scale uh, beyond that and the financial scale that you have because you can tap debt markets, obviously equity markets are always an option as a listed company. Uh, so I'm curious how you weigh up say Janssen or Potash. And I know you get a lot of questions about lithium. It wasn't one of my questions that I was going to ask, but I think there's maybe a good juxtaposition between where the opportunity sits for a business of BHP scale? Yeah, look, it's, it's a really good question. We quite often get asked that in relation to also the focus today around critical minerals and, mm. and how does that sort of play through. If, if you step back and you look at our overall strategy, what we actually fundamentally at a core of that strategy is that we want to be in long life assets uh, well down the cost curve. Um, and so if I take the potash uh, scenario and with Janssen, what we anticipate when we're up and running in 2026 and with Janssen Stage 2 in 2029, as I mentioned, is that the Janssen operation will certainly be in the bottom quartile of the cost curve and if not, right at the pointy end um, mm. of, of that overall cost curve. Um, so that puts you in a very good position. Um, it's also a resource that we know will be here for about a century. Hmm. So this is a long life um, asset that we're actually looking to invest in. Uh, in a lot of ways, and um, you know, for the shareholders, if they want to, there's uh, a lot of information on our website that actually talks about the potash market because it is a, a new commodity for BHP, and I encourage people to, to go and have a look. But there's a lot of things that we look at that and see some similarities with the iron ore business. Mm -hmm. If you look at the iron ore business, as we talked about earlier, there's sort of two main regions in the world of production. Brazil and the Pilbara in Western Australia. Uh, and uh, from that side of things, it's quite a concentrated supply market in that sense. Much the same actually sits with potash. Mm. Um, there's two main regions in the world. One is Canada, where we're investing, uh, and the other one is the former Soviet Union. Um, right. And so that's Belarus and Russia today as the two main sources of potash supply into the world. And that's around about 80%. Mm. Um, you know, uh, right now, obviously, there's a very unfortunate uh, event occurring with Ukraine and Russia, um, and that actually is impacting the supply side uh, of the equation. Um, that gives us some confidence and, and is part of the reason that we brought Janssen Stage 2 forward from where we did see it originally being sort of 2035 into that 2029 window um, for, for that commodity to come in or that operation to come into operation. So for us, um, our strategy is always about long life uh, assets, leveraging off the mega trends that we talked about earlier from an overall demand perspective, but understanding that what we are is a supplier into that and we want to be low down on that cost curve because that's the best way to ride out um, fluctuations that occur. Mm. I think I've heard, and if, if the other side of that is that kind of lithium question, which um, I might step in for the listeners here. Um, my understanding is that that cost curve is not the same shape in effect as maybe it is for the other commodities which you are targeting. And it's almost an abundant, in abundant supply. Although maybe perhaps it has two primary extraction methods that are quite different, um, one being chemical process. Uh, and so that's probably, that factors into the decision making around allocating to something like that. Yes, so lithium, um, we will openly say, we think the demand curve looks pretty good for, for lithium, not dissimilar to nickel. 
Uh, a lot of that's going into the battery technology. Mm. You know, we spoke earlier about electric vehicles, you and I both mm. having one, and one of the biggest components of that is obviously uh, the battery side of things. So we certainly think battery technology uh, will play into lithium and nickel uh, as such. What we don't like about the lithium market is the life of the assets, the mines themselves, and the scale of them. Right. Uh, it's quite a fragmented supply curve. Um, there's lots of players, um, and, and that's something that we don't see as attractive uh, as we do, say, the nickel or the copper or the potash market, which are all those future-facing commodities that we see as core to our overall strategy. Um, so will people make good money and get some good returns out of lithium? Yes, uh, but we just don't see it as a scale that actually fits BHP today. Mm. And fair enough. Uh, one of the business units which we received a lot of questions about is the coal business and two different types of coal, of course. Uh, can you maybe talk about the, the key differences and where your focus will shift to going forward? Because divestments and these types of things are also, you know, the flip side of acquisitions and focus areas. So can you talk through how you think about that at a high level? Yes. So I... I Step back one and just sort of say, again, I think this is very consistent with our overall BHP strategy. Um, and so what we've always said that we believe is that steel will be an important component to helping the world decarbonise. Um, today, over 50% of the world's steel is actually made through blast furnaces. Um, and, and for um, listeners to this, uh, a blast furnace takes the iron ore and then ultimately uses metallurgical coal to produce the furnace, mm. um, the, the energy that's needed to, to uh, um, obviously convert the iron ore into, into steel. Um, and today, uh, that's where we're focused from our metallurgical coal position position whereby we want to be at the premium end of that. So the hard coking coal, mm. uh, which again for, for listeners is uh, a way that the steel mills can actually decarbonise their footprint. It, they have less um, carbon emitted if they're burning premium hard coking coal mm. than the lower grade. And so what we have done is sold our coal assets in Queensland that were of the lower grade and have moved out of that segment. Um, we now will have in excess of 90% of the coal that we're producing in uh, BMA, our joint venture that we actually have, uh, will be of that premium hard coking coal. Right. Um, what we also have, uh, just to, to round out our coal portfolio, we do have our New South Wales energy coal business, uh, which is different coal. It goes thermal coal, which is going into power um, markets. Mm. And that's an asset that we have announced that we will close in 2030. Um, so we're in a transition through to see how that mine can close. Uh, and uh, we will, as part of that, be leaving some, you know, quite considerable amount of coal in the ground, but looking to convert that asset into other um, opportunities, uh, which is actively a process that we're working through with the community in New South Wales at the moment. Mm. I guess this gives rise to this idea of divestments and uh, acquisitions. Some, maybe some people would say, David, that you know, you're selling a great asset for a cheap price because it's kind of, in some senses, maybe unloved. You know? And on the other side, people will say you're buying expensive because you're buying resources that are in demand and growing. And they might, you know, a critic might say, well, BHP is not the only one that recognizes you know, there's more electric cars on the road or something like this. So. Thinking about that capital allocation, some of the questions which I know you fielded before, but thinking about that, um, how do you how do you get discipline on the divestment or selling process? I guess is the question. Yeah. So, so for starters, what I would say to you is we obviously have a view of value as we see assets over that medium to longer term because that's what we need to be able to assess. So let's take um, any of the assets that we actually sold on the coal side of things. Um, you know, they have 20 plus years of, of life. So that's the, the time frame that we need to be looking at these assets to evaluate what their value is going to be. Um, 
and that actually means you've got to have a view of the long-term pricing uh, alongside mm. demand supply. And we obviously use our own internal group to actually look at that. We reference that versus other analysts and market commentators um, to see uh, and stress test our view around those. So we come up with a value. Um, what I would say is I think the assets that we have sold, we've got good value for. Um, and what is important as part of that, it's a bit a bit about how we then cycle, recycle that capital back into other businesses that we do see having a better return than continuing to maintain those operations by putting you know capital to work there. So we're very um, conscious of the fact that uh, you know you, you don't want to become an asset hugger and fall too much in love with with assets. You need to constantly look at the strategy, constantly think about where can we extract value for for our overall shareholders. We're very comfortable with how we've executed that strategy. Um, you didn't uh, touch on it, but, you know, that also was one of the reasons that we did uh, move our oil and gas business, our petroleum business, into Woodside, as an example. Um, by doing that, we did create one of the top 10 independent mm. oil and gas companies. And as it was a demerger, uh, our shareholders got to then choose whether they wish to have that exposure into oil and gas or not. Mm -hmm. um, through that uh, merged entity at Woodside. So we look at ways to actually move the portfolio that also are you know, mindful of shareholders' interests and, and just where shareholders can get a, a satisfactory return. Because I guess that gives us a somewhat of a segue into um, a view on sustainability, decarbonisation, these types of things, because some people, some shareholders might say, well, you know, I like BHP as it was, you know, with the with energy coal, with oil and gas. Um, but I guess that's kind of the bridge, isn't it? That you can offer an exit to those people that maybe want to pick and choose um, where their dollars are exposed. But maybe if we think about what is in your circle of influence and what you can control, people will be familiar with scope one, two, three emissions. I know that the business is doing a lot of work on that front um, going back a few years and going forward. At, at the same time wanting to expand operations, become more profitable, become a more efficient business. Can you maybe give us some context about how you and the team uh, think about sustainability, both what you can control and those things that you can't control? I know some of the questions that were on the shareholder Q&A, which are fantastic that, that you and the team do. Um, one of the questions was about you know electrifying trucks and these types of things. So maybe just a, the view that you have on sustainability as a business and then also outside um, what you can control, like OEMs. Mm. Um, so let me start by saying we have our social value framework, which picks up the sustainability side of things. There's six pillars that actually sit mm. uh, in that. Um, and it's not an adjunct to the business. It is just business as usual. It is something that we need to embed and have embedded into just our overall framework and how we actually think about things. So go back to my capital allocation discussion that we were having earlier. As part of that, we look at the sustainability of our operations. Um, we clearly are committed to uh, our targets that we've set in 2030, a 30% reduction, and also our targets for 2050, um, where in FY23, we actually saw an 11% reduction in our emissions. Um, so we're well on track to actually hit our targets that we've actually set. The point behind that is it's just now how we need to operate. Mm. Um, it's the way we need to run the business and therefore we constantly look at what is the most efficient way to actually do that uh, across a range of aspects. And that's why I will just sort of call out the social value side of things because it's not just about the decarb scope one and two and three, uh, which I will come back to, but it's part of a holistic view that we actually have around social value which goes to the amount of Indigenous partnerships that we actually have, our overall Indigenous spend. It goes to the diversity of our workforce and how that actually operates. And, you know, it's very pleasing that we now have over 35% of the workforce are female uh, into the mix. So there's a range of things that we actually look at, water, um, biodiversity uh, into that overall operation. 
Now, specifically back on scope one uh, and two, which are the ones that we can control directly because they're the mm. they're the, the parts that impact us. Uh, what we do know today is the majority of our emissions are either power or diesel that is used in running our f- truck fleet, mining fleet. Mm. Uh, on the on the power side of things, we're well progressed on entering into renewable power agreements, uh, and that's uh, right across the globe. Um, so that, uh, we're making good progress on that. We see our, we have a clear path as to what we need to do in relation to that. When you come to the mining uh, fleet side of things, we have formed partnerships with Caterpillar and Komatsu uh, looking at electrification of the fleet um, and we're progressing down that path. Um, just so uh, shareholders are aware, most of that activity will certainly be post-2030. Um, and that's really because that technology is continuing to develop. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you and I both referenced electric vehicles that we've purchased. The battery technology to actually run a loaded truck uh, is still needing to be refined so that we can actually run those, you know, 24-7 uh, and continue to actually think about how we would charge them while they're running and, and operating, which enables us to actually ensure that we're getting the movement of the dirt that we actually need in our mining operations. So mm. that's that's an activity that we continue to actually work on. Uh, in relation to scope three, we formed a number of alliances and partnerships with uh, 19% of the current world steel producers. And we're working with them on a range of different act- activities to see how they can actually reduce their emissions. Um, so we're active across all three areas. Um, we're also very active in the freight market right? Um, in, in relation to shipping and how that progresses as well. So we see this as a holistic view across the business. Um, it certainly isn't something that is seen as an adjunct, as I said earlier, but is very much part of how we actually ensure that we have a sustainable business moving forward. Mm. I've got uh, two more questions, uh, and these are more on management and things that uh, you have pieced together. Um, a lot of people that listen to the show run their own business, um, are corporate leaders of some uh, description. Uh, I'm curious, you know, you've been here at BHP for a while now, and You've probably learned a bit from Mike and the team around you. So I'm curious what those might, what some of those lessons might be that you've pieced together recently. Uh, I like to think of what we do as capital allocators as effectively just scratching curiosity continuously and trying to develop and learn and refine our craft. Yeah, so I think a couple of things that I'd mention. The first thing is to actually acknowledge that BHP is a global operation. Mm. Um, you know, it, it clearly it has uh, far-reaching impacts across the globe. And one of the, the exciting things about that and one of the things that I find, you know, from a leader perspective is you need to also understand the cultural norms or differences mm. uh, in various different re- regions and how that actually plays out. So, you know, one of the key learnings for me is also the messaging that we need to have. Um, and how sometimes you need to, you know, tailor that depending upon the audience that you're actually dealing with. And mm. I suppose it's no different talking to shareholders. Mm. Um, shareholders all, all have a slightly different, um, you know, reference point or, or influence as well. So for me, one of the great things about BHP is that global operation that we actually have. The fact that we do have a diverse workforce, that we do actually listen well to inputs that are actually coming through our BHP operating system to ideas that that people are coming up with. Uh, And it's a matter of how do we sort of harness those. So from a leader perspective, it's, as you said, a lot of it's about allocating resources, whether that's capital or people to the right areas where we see that we can get the best return. Uh, And that's on an enterprise wide basis in a global business uh, is part of the the fun uh, Mm. and the challenge. I would encourage anyone that uh, is watching or listening to go ahead and visit the BHP website because you can take part in shareholder Q&As and see previous recordings. It's even available on YouTube, which is a wonderful thing, I think, um, just to see your full team around you just being candid with all shareholders and and approaching their questions with respect and um, genuine intent. Uh, One final question I've got for you is more on the philosophical side, and you've had a very kind of distinguished career, I think it's fair to say. Uh, we sit up here and we look out and it's wonderful. Um, and BHP is a 
fantastic institution, uh, not just here in Australia. And I'm curious if you could perhaps go back and tell yourself an early, David, one thing about finance, business, investing, whatever that may be, what you would say to him. Yeah, look, I think that early on, um, it's it's a matter of just actually saying, don't sit in your comfort zone. Um, mm. You know, I've recently taken up golf and I, I'm not a good golfer, but you know, I was reading an article whereby uh, someone was saying the worst thing you can do is actually play safe. <laughs> it, you know, it uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't be conservative, but there's a difference between playing safe and being conservative. Mm. And I think in business, uh, you, that's parallel holds. Um, you know, the reality is, Business is risk. There is risk associated with everything that we do. Uh, what you've got to be able to do is manage that risk, assess that risk, and then make a decision where you need to go. I would say perhaps early on in my career, I was playing it too safe. Mm. Um, look, I'm a CFO, so by nature, I'm also probably <laughs> conservative, but not getting the two mixed up a- as part of that. I think that that's probably a lesson I would have said to myself, you know, be mindful that business is about taking risks because that's how you ultimately get a return as mm. well. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't do that in a prudent, conservative manner, but playing it safe isn't going to give the return either. I love that. Calculated risk. Wonderful. Well, David, thank you for taking some time to join me. And on behalf of ASA and the RAS community, we really appreciate your time. No, great to be with you. Thanks very much. 